Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another AccuColor webinar series. Uh, today, we're doing something a little different. I'm personally excited for this one, and I'm really glad to have Alan Demophilus on today. Today, uh, he's going to be going over creating a uh, stylized 3D character in Cinema 4D Lite. Uh, we're going to have Q&A towards the end of the um, webinar. So if you have any questions, send them in. And don't worry, we'll get to them. Uh, Alan will be sure to answer each and every one of them. Uh, take it away, Alan. Cool. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, Ben Q, for having me. Um, as Ali said, my name is Alan Demophilus. I'm a freelance 3D motion designer based in the Texas area. And uh, this presentation is basically all around my love for Cinema 4D and After Effects. And if you're watching, you might be curious about Cinema 4D. You might be an After Effects user or a, or a Creative Cloud user, but never opened up Cinema 4D. Uh, you may not even know that Cinema 4D Lite comes with After Effects uh, bundled in for free. And so the goal here is really to provide an overview of what's possible uh, inside Cinema 4D, inside this version of Cinema 4D, uh, with regards to creating stylized 3D characters. Um, and because that subject can go pretty deep, um, I'm just going to touch on some of the, the bigger features and concepts uh, to help you get familiar and, and hopefully set you up on a little bit of a journey inside Cinema 4D. So um, inside Cinema 4D, or I'm sorry, inside of After Effects, let me uh, open up, uh, kick into After Effects here. So this is the After Effects interface, as you may or may not know it. Um, but one way to launch Cinema 4D uh, is to, well, first of all, install it. Uh, I think it's an optional install now. And in order to use it, you have to sign up for a free Maxon account. And once you sign in, then you can uh, launch it traditionally like you would uh, any other program. Um, or you can right click inside your project window here and say new Maxon Cinema 4D file. So I'm gonna select that option. And under my desktop here, I'll just save this out as a character build, maybe. We'll just call this character build. Um, and once you save that out, uh, After Effects will launch Cinema 4D Lite. And you should see something that looks like this. Now, this, is, uh, this might be a pretty daunting view to you because it's all gray and it looks uh, a lot of buttons, right? So um, let's do a quick tour uh, of the interface. Um, the biggest part here that you see in the middle is the viewport. And this is where you're going to be interacting with all your objects. Um, you're going to set up your cameras in here, your lights. Um, and to the right of that, we have kind of the strip of creation tools. So After Effects works with splines, much like you would find inside of uh, Adobe Illustrator. So these are all vector-based and different forms. You have these primitives over here, which are, um, you know, your basic forms like a cube, a sphere, capsule, we use all those a bit, quite a bit. Um, if you've opened up Cinema 4D uh, and you're an After Effects user, maybe you're a motion designer, you might have used this quite a bit to generate 3D text. Um, and so that's kind of one of the go-to ones, but you know, as another use case, it's really quite capable at creating stylized characters, as we'll see. Uh, these green characters or green icons are gonna be the generators. So this, uh, you'll feed this into, or I'm sorry, you'll feed splines into these, and these will generate geometry from the splines. So one will, one uh, pretty important one that we'll look into later is called the sweep object. And then we have a series of deformers. These basically take the geometry that you have inside your object manager and does certain operations to them, like bending them or, or tapering them, bulging them out, things like that. And down below here, we have things like uh, cameras, lights, uh, and we'll touch on that a little bit. Over here, uh, we have the object manager, and this is kind of a list view of all the objects and cameras, lights, everything inside your scene uh, is gonna live here. And one important concept to note is that you can start to put things in a hierarchy. Um, so you can put uh, objects as a child of a parent and parent that to a parent and parent that to a parent. So it can get pretty nested and pretty, um, pretty deep really quickly. Uh, but it's a really powerful way to, to work because once you move the parent, the child will move along with it. So um, let's do this. Let's uh, start off since we're working with characters, right? We wanna make sure that we uh, start off with some geometry. And to do that, I'm gonna start off with a simple sphere. And here's our sphere right there in the middle of the screen. And because I have it selected in my object manager, down here in this panel, we have what's called the uh, attribute manager. This contains all the attributes uh, of that 
particular objects. From the coordinates, we have position, scale, rotation, like you would find in After Effects. So you can move these numerically. You can rotate them around, which you won't really see since it's a sphere. Uh, and under the object tab, we have uh, what are called like parametric uh, or live. It's kind of like shape layers in that way. So you can at any point in time, non-destructively um, go through here and make tweaks to this after the fact, after creating it, right? So here I am bringing up the radius. The segments, you'll notice that if I bring this down, our sphere becomes much more faceted. Uh, and in fact, if I come over here to this display menu for the uh, viewport, we can switch this over to garage shading with lines, and that'll actually show us the lines that make up uh, the polygons for this particular object. So here's our segments, and as we increase this, we're just flooding it with more and more polygons. So to find a happy medium, I'm just gonna set this up to like maybe 20, and this is gonna be the basis of our head. Let's rename this. I'll just hit enter and hit call this head. And one of the other parts of the interface is this material manager. So it's this button right here. It's kind of hidden away, but it's a toggle to kind of help you save on a screen real estate. And with it, we can assign materials to our object. So uh, let's create a brand new material. I'll hit this plus sign and say new default material. That's fine. And again, because we have the selected, it shows up in our attribute manager. And if we go to basic, we can do some simple renaming here. We'll call this uh, skin. And because I want, um, well, under that basic tab, we have all of these different properties of the material. So we can affect the color, we can affect things like reflectance, kind of how shiny or how, uh, how dull or diffuse the uh, surface is. Uh, for right now, I'm just gonna select color. And if we go down here, you see that we have a, a color palette. So uh, if we want to get somewhere in the skin range here, maybe it's a more like Emmet yellow, like a, a Lego color, right? Something like that then we can take the swatch itself inside the material manager or any of these icons here, and we can either drag it onto the object itself, or we can drag it onto the object in the object manager. And you'll now see that we have a new icon here, and these are what are called tags. And tags are essentially um, real powerful modifiers for that particular object. So each object can have multiple tags. And if you go through here and look at this category, we have um, tags that can affect you know, cameras, your animation, uh, modeling. Uh, when you get into the full version of Cinema 4D, there's some simulation tags that will happen to let you do dynamics and have things physically bounce around and hit and collide with each other um, as they would in the real world. Uh, in this case, we're just working with one tag for right now, and that's our material tag. Um, Let's take this head and let's uh, duplicate it. So one way that we could do that is to select it. And if we can come over here to the side, the left-hand side, we have various tools here to manipulate our object in space. So we have the move tool. Uh, and if you hit E on the keyboard, that's the shortcut for that. R for rotation. You can see that we can rotate this around and then T for scaling. All right, so I'll just undo that because what I wanna do is actually uh, hit my move tool and I'm gonna drag this off into one axis here onto the right. And as I do, I'm gonna hold down Control or Command, and that's automatically going to duplicate or create a copy of this uh, head or sphere. And in the Object Manager, we have a new object. We'll just rename this ear. And obviously that's too big, so we'll hit T and scale this down. Uh, but we also want to squish this, and you'll notice that if we try to squish it with this one axis here, it's not doing such a great job. It's actually scaling it on all three axes, and that's because this is a parametric object. This is a live object, meaning uh, it's mathematically calculated or whatever, and we're not actually able to manipulate the individual polygons that make up this uh, sphere. So in order to get access to that, what we can do is right-click on the object, the ear object, and hit Make Editable. And when we do, we no longer have the properties here to alter the radius and the segments. Those go away. What you do get is the ability to manipulate the polygons. Up here at the top, we have the option to select through these different modes. So if I come over here to my selection tool uh, and click and click down here, and I'm going to switch this to brush selection, you'll notice that we have rectangle and lasso selection as well. I'll select my brush selection, and if I tap on one of the polygons, now I have this little gizmo that allows me to move just that one polygon, that one selection, right? So we have the ability to select edges as well. So if we can move this edge, maybe this way or that way, and of course the points. So here in this case, I'm gonna select all these polygons, 
by hitting Control A or Command A, and then come over here to our axis tool and just bring this in just on the X axis, maybe something like this. Can we have this flattened sphere, right? Uh, you'll notice that we have these black bars, top and bottom. I'm gonna get rid of that. That's basically our safe frames. So come over here to cameras and go to safe frames. And that way we have a little bit less visual clutter. Uh, I like to work with kind of minimally if, if I can as much as possible. All right, one more tweak to this ear that we'll do is actually, instead of having it just a regular flat plane like this, I wanna actually make it kind of concave, right? Introduce a little bit of detail to it. Uh, we're going to switch this main view into four different views. So you're not limited in cinema to just viewing from the perspective view. You can actually view from uh, top, uh, left, right, um, any, any view that you want. And to do that, we'll just hit this button up here, or you can hit F5 on the keyboard, and that will toggle you back and forth between perspective and this uh, four up view. So you see we have a view up here for the top view, down here for the right, and one for the front. Okay, so what I want to do now is actually come over to my uh, top view. Actually, let's let's go back into our perspective view because I want to select one polygon here, and I'm going to make we'll go to our polygon selection, and I'm going to select kind of the center here. And instead of just pushing it in by itself, you'll notice how we have this real uh, faceted look right here. It's 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 um, pretty angular. So we can either create more geometry to make that a little bit smoother, or we can use kind of bigger brush strokes um, and then smooth it out later. And so that's what I'm gonna do here, just so that we can work with as few polygons as possible, just to make it um, more manageable. And then we add the smoothing or more polygons to, to round it out later. Um, and I'll show you how to do that in a second. So let me undo this. And because we have our, um, we're in polygon mode and we have our, uh, selection mode here. If we go to our brush selection attribute manager, we have this thing called soft selection. If I enable this, you'll see that we get this different color and that's a fall off. So we originally selected these four polygons, but now this fall off um, or the soft selection rather is going to use a fall off to define how much the surrounding polygons are going to be affected. And as I bring this radius down inwards, you can see I'm affecting fewer and fewer polygons. So I actually wanna bring this up to maybe I'm just gonna visually guess here, guess here and say maybe 45 centimeters. And now if I go up to my top view or actually hit F5, we can come over here to this portion and bring this in on the X axis. And you can see what's happening. It's pushing and making the other portions of our ear and kind of making it a little bit softer, right? So this is just a little bit of a play, kind of making it a, a lot more like, like clay um, I actually want to maybe dial back on the uh, on the radius. Maybe we make this like 30. And then one other thing is that if we say uh, surface, you'll notice how the backside of our ear was being affected too. See how that's um, that's kind of got the the yellow tint to it. If we say surface, it's only going to affect the neighboring polygons from just the surface of our of our of our ear. So if I bring this in, there we go. Now, maybe the radius is a little too small. Let's bring this up to 50, something like so. Okay, something like that. Now, that looks really pretty nasty, especially up top here, uh, but that's okay, because what we're going to do is take this ear and make it a child of this object here called the subdivision surface. So with my object selected, I can actually come over here to subdivision surface, and then I'll hold down the option key or alt key, and when you let go, that subdivision surface automatically becomes apparent to the ear. You'll see now that we have a kind of a parent-child hierarchy here. So the ear is a child of the subdivision surface, and we automatically have a lot more polygons to work with, um, and it smooths out everything, although this up here at the top doesn't look so hot. So let's fix that. I'll come over here and turn off our subdivision surface, and now we're back to our regular polygons. There you go. And so let's go back in here to the ear, and maybe we just kind of smooth this out a little bit if we just uh, take a little bit. Actually, you know what? This is probably a lot more surgery than, than is needed for this. So I'm just going to leave this as is. You can definitely, in the uh, other versions or the full version of Cinema 4D, you have tools like smoothing. You act actually have a full uh, suite of sculpting tools, which allow you to go in and kind of surgically go through and uh, with a brush, take your um, mouse and start to 
uh, smooth over these edges uh, and it'll mathematically bring all these harsh edges and, and smooth them out. So this is kind of like the bare bones basic uh, sculpting capabilities, quote unquote sculpting, because it's technically not sculpting, it's just soft selection, right? So I'm gonna leave this as is, we'll just re rename this subdivision surface ear and uh, I'll leave this off right now because what we're gonna do now is go into our front view We'll make this large, and instead of this uh, display being all wireframes, I'm going to go to that garage shading with lines, and that way we can see kind of our full color. And now what we'll do is just take um, our ear, we'll select it, and then we'll come over here to our generators, and we'll say symmetry. And again, we'll do that same trick to make the symmetry object apparent of our ear, and I'll hold down Alt or Option uh, to make that happen. And Oops, I lied, because if when we do that now, the symmetry object now lives where that ear object lives. Instead, I'm going to undo this, because what, what we want to have happen is actually that symmetry object live dead center in the middle of our head. So I'm going to um, just de make sure we deselect all of our objects here and then re-add that symmetry. And now when we take the ear and manually make it a child of the symmetry object, you now should see, yep, there it is, our other ear. So let's come back over, hit F1 to get into our perspective view. And here we've got two ears. And if we just move one ear inwards like this, the other one's gonna follow suit. So whatever happens to one happens to the other. So in this case, I'm gonna maybe rotate this ear around, ear around maybe uh, rotate a little bit like this. And you can see that um, I'm hitting W on the keyboard to switch out from our local axis. Uh, the basically the way that the um, handle, the gizmo here is oriented to the object versus something like world. So if I hit this or hit W on the keyboard, this is gonna orient itself to the world. So now you can move this up true in true you know, Y space going straight up um, to, relative to the world instead of the object. So that's something you'll toggle back and forth a lot. Uh, in this case, I wanna use the ear as the center uh, or as the uh, alignment point so that I can drag this out this way. Okay, in context, our ear's looking a little big. So I'm just gonna scale this down, I'll hit T and bring this down a little bit. So something like that. Okay, uh, let's make some hair. Um, one of the cool things about Cinema 4D is that you can have multiple scenes open. Uh, and you can see on this on the top row, I've got multiple scenes already open, which I'll, I'll come back to later. Uh, but what I like to do is build out in a brand new scene uh, parts and elements that we can then copy paste back into our main build. Uh, and that just helps out for, for clutter. Um, and just visually, I, I like to see things as cleanly as possible. So uh, we'll hit plus up top here to create a brand new scene. And here we're gonna create um, some stylized hair. Uh, if you look at our simple character here that um, I, I previously built, I've got this guy and he's got um, you know a row of hair that's basically cubes that serve as kind of uh, big stylized strands. So let's recreate that uh, in this empty scene here by just creating a, a simple cube. Okay, um, you'll note that we have these yellow handles which allow us to gesturally rearrange uh, these parameters here for the size X, y, X, Y, and Z. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just create a rectangle that looks something like so, maybe a little bit larger. And we're gonna add some deformers to this namely the taper deformer. So if I hold down shift now before I let go of the uh, the taper button, it's going to add the taper as a child. And you'll see that it fits right there. If I select it again, uh, this yellow outline is the taper deformer. So what does this taper deformer do? Well, if we take the strength and move this around, you can see that it's manipulating the geometry and, and making one end of the object smaller than the other. But this is oriented in the wrong direction. This is not, uh, I actually want this to taper in the blue axis, the Z axis going this way. So if we go to alignment and hit, um, let's say Z uh, minus Z, and then we hit fit to parent, visually nothing happens uh, in the screen. But now if we take our strength and start to move this around, you can see that it's tapering off and making one side smaller than the other. Uh, I've got this curvature here that seems to be on by default, which allows us to like uh, push the edges to make them more round, but we're not seeing that affected inside of our cube. And that's because we don't have enough geometry to describe that curvature. If I come over here to display, you'll see that we have grout shading with lines. And this actually shows us our, as we saw earlier, the um, actual polygons that make up the object. But because all these segments are set to one, you're not gonna see anything. 
So under segments Z, let's start adding more segments along this line by just clicking and clicking and clicking. And now we're starting uh, to fill in that geometry to describe the curvature of the taper. So if I add this curvature, you can see it's now it's following the curvature of that taper. All right, lastly, what I wanna do is uh, add a bend deformer to this. Um, and I'm gonna click off of this uh, to make sure everything's deselected and add the bend in the wild here. You can see it's big orange cube. I'm gonna add it as a child of the cube, but I'm gonna add it after the taper. And there's an order of operations here. So you have kind of, you're working from top to bottom. Uh, if you're familiar inside of After Effects, you have your effects panel and everything works. If you add an effect one on top of the other, it kind of works its way procedurally downwards. And the same thing here inside of Cinema. So you're gonna get your cube, it's gonna get generated with the number of, of segments. It's gonna become uh, tapered with the values that we set here. And then we're gonna take that tapered cube and bend it. So here again, uh, with the bend object selected, I'm gonna hit minus Z and then hit fit to parent. And that orange cube is gonna fit right inside the confines of our object there. And now if I move this around, you can see that we're bending our cube uh, any which way. And we can actually take this angle and maybe move it up. Uh, we, we can do positive and negative um, values here. So I think I actually want this to go downward. So let's say negative 90 and we'll, do something like that for now. Again, this is all procedural, so we can always go back in here and change this after the fact. Um, and because it's procedural, you have these little keyframe buttons here that we can actually animate later on if we wanted to. So if you wanted something waving in the wind, like a flag, or maybe this is a tail, uh, this would be a, an easy way to animate that. Okay, one thing that we, um, again, I like to keep things visually clutter-free. Uh, and so we have these deformers that are kind of in the way. Uh, so what we can do is multi-select them and come over here to basic. And here we have the options to disable from view uh, our objects, their selected objects, um, and inside the viewport as well as inside the renderer. So any selectable object inside the object manager has this ability. So if we wanted to work with the cube in our viewport, but we don't want to render it for some reason, whatever reason, you can always go through here under the cube and say, hey, I want it visible in the viewport, but off in the render. And you'll notice that um, we have a red traffic light here that indicates to us visually that, hey, this is not going to render out. So I'm going to leave this at default, but Knowing that, we can take our uh, two selections here for the deformers and just turn those both off. Now, there's an alternative way to do this, and that's over here with this filter. Um, so it's visible in view here, but if you want to, you know, you don't want to manage, maybe you don't want to manage all the visibility for each individual object. Well, you can do it globally inside this, uh, inside this filter manager here, or filter uh, menu. So down here we have deformer, and notice that it's it's blue or purple, so indicating that it's on. So if we turn this off, now our visibility is still on and everything, um, but just inside of our viewport, it's considered off. So I'll, I'll be tapping that one a lot. In fact, you can tear off this object or this panel here, this menu, and if you want to have it float, you can have this uh, easily dockable or easily toggleable back and forth like so. Okay, let's rename this uh, hair or call it strand, right? And I'm gonna take this and introduce this into another generator here called an array. This array takes the object in question and spins it around and makes multiple copies. So let's take the strand object and make it a child of the array. And you can see that, all right, we've got our cube, uh, our deformed cube, and it's now moving around uh, this array. If we select the array object and go to the object tab, here we have the parametric controls here to control the radius, the number of copies. Um, right now, my orientation is kind of 180 what I want. So uh, let's do this. Let's take both of our taper and bend objects and we're gonna rotate this 90 degrees. So with both objects selected, I'm gonna go to my coordinates and then type in 90 here for the heading rotation value. And Oh, not 90, how about 180? There you go, that's what I'm looking for. Okay, uh, I'll come over here to my filter. Let's just turn off deformers. Oh, that's one thing about these uh, generators. They kind of, I don't know why, but they kind of disregard uh, the filter here inside the, um, the filter manager. So even though we have deformer off, it's still showing up. So I'm just gonna go ahead and 
do our little trick here. We'll select both of these and set this to off for visibility. And now we have kind of the beginnings of hair. So it's super stylized, right? Um, let's make a new material. We'll call this hair. And for this, I'm going to go for something a little, maybe in this area, something like so. And for the reflectance, actually, yeah, we can leave that up for right now. We'll just call that hair. I just want to have some a little bit of visibility inside the viewport. Uh, and then also, too, for the box itself, so it's just not so rigid and, and uh, angled here, I'm going to take the uh, strand, our original cube, go to the object uh, tab, and then go over to fillet or fillet. And that's just going to round out these edges. If uh, you can see here, if I disable the materials and you can do that inside here um, under options you can again this is just a viewport thing just to help you visualize it you can turn off the visibility of the materials by hitting that and now you can see that we have this fillet uh, radius we can make it larger or thinner uh, just to break it up and catch some light so it doesn't look so entirely flat right all right, what I'm going to do now is make a copy of this hair, and we're going to do another instance, or not, I shouldn't say another instance, but another copy. This is a fully editable thing. Uh, we'll call this hair two. Oops. And I'm going to bring this up in space, and I'm going to just introduce a little bit of variation to it. So uh, maybe this one has fewer copies, and maybe the bend is a little bit different. You know, something like that. Or you can actually take the bend object and rotate it, and you'll get a little bit of um, a cool cool twist on things, right? Maybe not that axis, but maybe this axis, something like that, just to get introduce a little bit of variation. I'll go back to the uh, second array here and make this a little bit smaller, bring these in maybe. And maybe we'll go for one more, and this is going to be actually... Here, let's do this. Let's take uh, one of the individual strands of hair and I'll pull this out and make a copy by holding down control or command. And that will make an individual strand for us to manipulate. And it looks like we're missing the material tag. So I'll just take our swatch and drag it on top there. And what we'll do here is I'm gonna come over here and make this bend go upwards. Cause I want this to like, you know, I want these individual strands of hair just so it's moving around, oops. I want to move the entire strand now. Something like that, we'll rotate this around. All right, just for now, until we can get this into the context of our uh, full scene. So let's grab all of this and let's put it under a null object. This makes it for really easy uh, management of your scene. This null object is uh, just a point in space. It's a handle, you know, this gizmo. Um, but we can make all these other objects if we select them and put them into the null object as a child, now we have full control over all those objects with just one null object. So let's rename this hair. Now you can see that I can move all of this with just one null object. Okay, I'll copy this and let's go back to our character build scene and let's paste in the work that we just did. Okay, and I'm gonna nudge this up. This seems a little too big for our scene, so I'll just scale this down, I'll hit T and bring down the scaling of this. All right, that's looking super awesome. <laughs> Again, this is all procedural. So if we don't like something and we don't like the way it's moving, then uh, we can certainly take the bend deformers and select those and just manipulate those as a whole. Uh, so uh, here's one trick. I wanna select all the bend deformers, but I don't wanna have to hunt and peck inside of my object manager to kind of find it. I know I've got a few of them. I don't know how many, but one way that we can easily find them is just doing a search. So inside the object manager, we have this um, magnifying glass. And here in the search, I'm just gonna type in bend. And it shows us all the bend objects that we can then multi-select and tweak to whatever we want. So in this case, the strength, maybe we wanna increase this a little bit more, something like that. So now we're, it's, you know, both these bend deformers are getting the exact same value which may not be helpful in this case here, whether we have like some intersecting going on. So I'll just I isolate just that one. Oops, looks like it's this one. And let's bring this back a little bit. Yeah, something like so. Just to, again, just to provide a little bit of variation. And now we have, let's get rid of our search term there and let's go in and select that one strand that we had. And I'm gonna rotate this to get it to kind of go forward this way and just manipulate it a little bit to get um, kind of a stylized hair. 
So maybe we do one and maybe we do another, maybe do one more, right? So we get kind of three extra strands on top of this. Now you notice that we have this extra bit on top of the head there that we're seeing, and we have you know all this backside looks pretty ridiculous. He's kind of looking kind of three stooges, three stooges like Mo, right? I'm going to select the uh, original head object, and I'm going to duplicate that. And instead of being a full sphere under the object manager, I'm going to select the type and change that from a sphere to hemisphere, which is you know half of a circle, half of a sphere, sphere. Let's make this a little bit larger and one or two clicks ought to do it. And then let's replace the material here with skin uh, for our hair material. And now we can rotate this around. And now that's kind of the, uh, his kind of a scalp. All right, that's looking pretty cool. Uh, let's do a little, a little bit of uh, Scene management here. I'm going to take do that uh, null trick again. We'll say uh, this is going to be head, and I'll switch over to all four of these views here because what I want to do is actually put this object down at the base of the neck. You know where where you know if you rotate your head, and that's the point of articulation. So I want to mimic that. Um, it's not going to rotate from the center of the head. It's going to move uh, where the head meets the neck, right? So let's move this head object. We'll make sure that we're in the uh, model mode or object mode here. And with our move tool selected, I can actually move this down towards the base, kind of somewhere here. And then I'll take everything and make that a child of the head. And so now when we move the head, let's go here and make full screen our perspective view. Now when we rotate, it's gonna rotate and move around like a head normally would. Uh, we need some eyes. Let's go through here. Um, because we have a symmetry object, we can actually put you know, another sphere down here for eyeballs. So let's add in a, a sphere. And I'm going to bring this forward. Obviously, that is too big. I'll scale this down. Oh, interestingly, we can have the beginnings of a nose here. So let's, let's use that. We can actually uh, let's pull this out of the symmetry object. And I'm going to rename this nose. And I'll control or command and drag a copy under the symmetry object, and that will get us the I. Let's rename this one I, E-Y-E, -E, I can spell, I promise. Uh, this I object now, it, because it's under the symmetry object, I can move this around, and there we go. We have the beginnings of an eyeball. Uh, maybe we move the eye and the nose a little bit down, or maybe the hair is too in the way. So I'm going to select the hair object and just rotate this around a little bit maybe so it doesn't cover his eyeballs, something like that. Um, and maybe for, uh, you know, maybe eyelids, we want to describe some eyelids. Um, let's duplicate the eye itself and then make this object called uh, eyelid. And then we'll do our hemisphere trick here again. So we'll go to the object and then make this a hemisphere, half circle, right? And make this just a little bit larger. And then we can rotate this inwards. We can get full blinks later on if we wanted to, doing something like that. Uh, we need to add some color to this. So let's grab our skin. Actually, let's duplicate the skin um, material. And we'll make a just a, sh a slight variation, a slight sh change in shade here, just to get us some slight variation between this and our original skin color, which I need to apply to the nose as well. And then for the eyeball, uh, I'm just going to go for just kind of a darker color. Actually, I think, did I not save? Sometimes I'll do this. I'll go back and forth between different scenes and steal uh, from one thing or another. Uh, so, you know, here, I thought I had made a different darker color here, but let's go ahead and call this uh, dark or black. But I'm not going to go full black here, just a, a darker shade somewhere in this, because rarely are things ever really full black in, in reality and nature. All right, that's the beginnings of our thing. Uh, you notice that we have our symmetry object here with this plane. That might be a little annoying, so I'll just go back into my symmetry object and come here and disable show planes. And while we're here, uh, you might notice that you have some of these um, properties that are yellow. And these yellow uh, highlights are basically um, Cinema 4D telling you that this is a brand new feature for this particular release. Uh, currently, we're working with release uh, 2023. So this new symmetry object is new. Uh, everything here inside, um, well, you might not see some of the newer options here, but anything that's new is going to be highlighted yellow. 
All right, so let's move on to building out um, some of the arms. Now, the arms and, and the legs, any limb really can be described by uh, using what's called the sweep object. And again, let's go through here and uh, start a new scene or just use this as a temp to build this out. Actually, let's go back to our build object and or character build and let's save this. It's important to save kids. Um, a sweep object. So what a sweep object is, um, we can take two splines uh, and feed them into a sweep object and it'll create geometry. So the splines that we're gonna create are, one of them is going to be, I believe this one's called the profile spline. So this is gonna be the outward um, sphere or uh, spline that is going to be swept along another spline. So here the circle is one piece. And now let's grab another, actually we're gonna, well here, let's do this. Let's make a circle and a rectangle. And let's make this rectangle rather big. And we'll pull that out so they're not uh, children of one another. And then over here under the generators, we'll go to sweep object. So here's the sweep object. It's a generator. Again, it's gonna take two splines as an input. So I'll take the both of those splines and put them into the sweep. And now we have the circle being swept along the rectangle. And this is creating geometry. So this circle can actually be different. You know, it doesn't have to be a circle. It can be something else. It can be, you know, if we bring the circle number down to, to one, now we have this really faceted form. Uh, this rectangle doesn't have to be a rectangle. If we swipped it, uh, switched it around, if we swap these, we can feed one into the other. And now we have this square or this rectangle shape being swept along this circle, which doesn't really seem to make sense because we got the circle set to a number of zero segments. There we go. Now we have kind of the beginnings of a of a tube here. All right, but um, this isn't what we want. We want to use this tool. We want to use the sweep object to create uh, limbs. So we want we could use a uh, a cylinder, which essentially is what we're building. But we want to be able to bend and deform that cylinder to form, you know, a shoulder, an elbow, a wrist, right? One continuous object. So I'll delete that cylinder. I'm going to keep the circle and lose the rectangle because now what we're going to do is come over here to the front view. I'll hit F4 for front view. Uh, and if I hit H, we should be able to see, yep, there's that circle. And I'm going I'm to make sure that um, we have nothing selected here because we're going to move over to the left hand, left hand side and select our spline pen. So instead of picking from predefined splines, we're going to make our own. And with that uh, spline tool, Selected. I'm just going to tap here for once for the elbow, uh, the shoulder, another time for the elbow, and one for the wrist. Super basic, right? Um, now, to get out of this tool, I'm just going to hit escape, and that's going to create a brand new spline with those three points. And if I take that spline and move it as a child of the sweep, the second uh, part right there, you can see that we have nothing but a big mess. <laughs> All right, so we have this bent straw, right? Our circle is too big, so I'll select my circle and bring this down. Now you can see, all right, we have a bendy straw. Um, and this is where it gets interesting because that could be a stylistic choice, right? The sweep object is uh, generating geometry based off of the parameters of these two objects or these two splines. So with the spline object, the, the one we uh, manually created, let's come over here and instead of Bezier, I'm gonna select this B spline. And so, Right now, you can see that Cinema 4D is drawing that spline or drawing geometry along that spline, but now we have a lot more smooth curvature here. And that's thanks to this uh, adaptive feature. If, if we switch this out to uniform, you can see that we're getting more and more geometry or less and less if we decided to. Now we're back at our, our bendy straw. So this is a cool way to get um, this bendy straw thing in action because we can then come over to our selection and if we're in point mode, we can select the point, which is barely visible, and we'll fix this here in a second, but we can take that point and move it around, and now we're moving around kind of our elbow, right? So that's kind of cool. We can select our, our bottom one, and here's our wrist, but I'm moving this uh, in in space because I'm inside a, a sub object of the spline, which is not very handy when we're, you know, we want to animate this on later on. Uh, and it becomes really cumbersome to to get uh, manipulating. You know, you don't want to have to dive into this just to be able to move, move the wrist. You want to be able to select something on screen. 
So this is going to be a little bit technical, uh, but this is the magic of you know what Cinema 4D Lite has. It has this uh, feature called Expresso, which is uh, Maxon or Cinema 4D's visual uh, expression language. So instead of writing code, you know, if you're familiar with After Effects and you use JavaScript, you know, you're writing code a lot. Well, Expresso is a tag that you can apply. So I'm going to take the spline and go to my tags and go to programming, Expresso. And what this allows us to do is use these nodes to kind of feed one node into another. And that ultimately starts building up logic uh, that in place of, you know, handwritten uh, words to create, you know, functionality. All right, enough talking. Let me show you what I mean. Basically, what I want to do is I want to take uh, these three uh, these three points of the spline and control them uh, using nulls instead. So I'm going to take nulls here. I'm just going to tap the null button three times, one, two, three, and we'll call the first one shoulder. We'll call the next one elbow, as you might guess, elbow. And the last one we're going to call wrist. All right, the cool thing about these is because it's a null object in space, we can actually select them inside the viewport. We can't really see them because right now they're all dots. So with all three of these selected, I can change the shape of my null object to other objects that we can actually see inside of our viewport. And the one I'm gonna use is called cube. And if I make this a little bit larger, now you can see we have the ability to, if I deselect this, I can go through and, um, oops, if I go to my object mode, now I can select the sweep, the object itself, or I can select the null, and I can move them around. So that's going to be way easier to, to you know, manipulate the limb rather than going into the spline and selecting the points and moving it around, yada, yada, yada. All right, to do that, we're going to need a little bit of espresso. So I'm going to take my spline object and drag this in, and this object is part of the ingredients. We need some more ingredients. We need to grab all three of our controllers. These control nulls, we'll drag those in individually. And then we're going to need one piece here called point, uh, the point node. So under here, we have a list of a whole bunch of nodes that do a whole bunch of functionality, which, you know, way outside the scope of this. But what we're going to do is hit this magnifying glass to do a search, and we're going to type in point. And under Expresso General, we have the point node. Let's grab that point node. And inside here, what we want to do is have the point node. Sorry, let me back up. We're feeding left to right, right? There's input, which is the blue uh, color. And we have an output for the node, which is the red color. I want to output from the spline the state of the object. This is going to be a reference. We're going to say, hey, whatever node uh, is looking downstream, look at me as the object. So in this case, we're going to, this point node is going to reference the spline as the object. You can easily swap this out. I could put this as a sweep object, any other object you can feed into here. From here, I'm going to go over on the left-hand side of the input of the point and say point position. Now I'm going to alter the point itself of the spline using one of these other objects. So here under shoulder, this is the shoulder null that we have. I'm going to steal as an output I'm going to go over here to coordinates. We'll go to global position, global position. This is now an output to feed into the point's point position. And if when I let go of this, you'll see that our tube or our limb moves into place already because this is already instantaneously working. So if I take my shoulder now and start to move this around, let's come back into object mode. Now that I'm moving that null, the position of that null is now driving the point of this spline because of this espresso. Right? So this is this is really handy because now we can attach things to the shoulder or attach things to the wrist by adding it as a child. So that makes it really easy to get um, a kind of an animatable rig going. All right. So I'm gonna quickly duplicate this. Let's uh, take this, select all three of them, we'll hold down control, and we're gonna replace the shoulder with the elbow. Actually, let's do this. Let's take the uh, shoulder um, node, and you can see that it's referencing the shoulder object, the shoulder null here. I'm just going to go through and take the elbow object and replace it, and now we have an elbow uh, null feeding into this point. All right, and let's go ahead and get rid of this. We'll duplicate this one more time. And again, we'll take the elbow node here and replace its reference, uh, tell it to reference the wrist. 
Okay, now you notice that it didn't jump to any of the other points because they're all kind of exist in the same space. So uh, let's take our wrist and move this around and you'll see that it's still not moving uh, the bottom of our, of our limb. And that's because our points have a mode here called, uh, or a parameter rather, called the point index. And that's basically the point number. Remember how we like drew in uh, one point, two point, three point for the uh, shoulder, elbow, wrist of our spline? Well, in programming, for some reason, uh, the first point that you do is a, a zero value. So that's why if we select our uh, shoulder rig here, our point value is set to zero. So we need to change the elbow, this point to point one, and our wrist value, we need to set this to a point value or point index of two. And now we should have a rig that works as we expect. So if we take our elbow and move this out, now we have, we can actually get rid of this. Bye-bye, Expresso. Now we have uh, our elbow and we have our wrist. And because the, el or because the wrist is a child of the elbow, anything that we do to the elbow is gonna happen to the wrist. We may or may not want that. Um, I might come back to that. Uh, and but for now, I'm gonna unparent these and make these distinct objects so that way we can have control over uh, our elbow and our shoulder independently. So there we go. Now we have a shoulder. We can select this null object for the elbow, and now we can select this for the wrist. All right. So now we're getting somewhere. Okay, let's stylize this sweep object a little bit because right now it's just a kind of a bendy, a bendy tube, a bendy straw. If we select the sweep object, we can do a couple things here. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna come over to my circle and make this a little bit larger a little bit thicker, I should say. Then under the sweep object, object tab, we have the ability to animate the end growth, which is handy because actually we can use, um, you know, one sweep to be the arm and maybe this other sweep can be, you know, halfway through to become a sleeve, like a short sleeve. So uh, in fact, let's, well, maybe I might be getting ahead of myself. Let's, uh, let's build out the arm first. Let's go ahead and add in a wrist, I mean, a, a hand. So, uh, We'll go through here, add in a sphere. Uh, let's pull it out of that hierarchy and put the sphere as a child of the wrist. And we want the sphere to occupy the exact same space as the wrist. So because it's a child of the wrist, we can come over to the coordinates of the sphere and just right click on these little arrows here and that will zero out the position. And now we have that sphere living exactly where this wrist um, null object is. All right, so let's go back into the sweep. And again, let's let's try and stylize this. Maybe we wanna taper uh, the wrist to be smaller in diameter than, than the shoulder. We can come over to our object uh, tab and then come over here to end scale and bring this down. And now we have kind of skinnier wrists in comparison to the, the top part of our bicep. And instead of having this flat round uh, end here, we can actually make this into uh, a cap, a rounded cap. So if you go to caps, and if we go to separate controls, we can actually uh, make both of these. Actually, let's, let's leave it as start and, and end. And if we start to introduce a size to this, you can see what's happening. We're bringing in some round curvature instead of that full cap, a uh, flat cap, something like so. If we turn off the uh, grout shading with lines and just go to grout shading, you'll see that we have this like weird line here which I don't want. So that's just a shading thing, the way that the Cinema 4D is drawing on the material and it has something to do with the Fong tag. So uh, I'll just come over here and deselect use edge breaks and that should clear it right up, smooth it up. Okay, now we have our sphere and because we had uh, made the sweep object have this cap, it actually extended beyond the point of our wrist controller. So I'm just gonna reposition the sphere a little bit over down here, maybe make it a little larger. Maybe we take a, you know, let's take a cylinder or a tube rather, uh, and we'll put this in as a child of the wrist. Again, we'll do our coordinates here, our coordinate trick, zero out our coordinates, and we can make this a little bit larger. And I'm just gonna make these little kind of uh, stylized wrists here, something like so. Okay, so again, we, we have you know the controls for this. We can move our wrist around and we can manipulate the way that our arm uh, or limb looks just by simply going through and altering values for our sweep inside of our object. 
Um, one thing we can also do here, I should touch on this because this is really powerful, uh, under details for the object uh, tab, we have this scale um, section here for details. You can actually add more nodes or knots to this. So if I hold down control and click on this, you see I added this control handle here, which brings down the scale right in the middle and then brings it back up to full scale. So you can really get some interesting looks this way uh, just by adding and subtracting and manipulating this. All right. Um, that's kind of the overview of building these limbs. And I took the liberty of coming over here and building out body parts based on this same concept, right? All of this is built using uh, sweep nerves or sweep nerves. That's the old name for sweep object uh, in R23 or release 2023. So all of these, here's that uh, same technique of the sleeve applied to uh, an arm. And so I've got multiple objects making this hand. And you can see that uh, it's basically just a cube and a couple, um, it's a couple of tubes or cylinders rather. So we have that. I've got this robot arm, I've got these boxer arms. Um, and these are all just, you know, simple geometry that, that I created using the available tools in here, using primarily the, the sweep object. So uh, that is building out these different body parts and, I took the same concept to build out multiple uh, faces and heads. Um, and the cool thing about this is that you can mix and match. Once you have this little library of things going and, and you like an iteration of something, then you can copy what you have and put that into you know, a master scene file that you can use for later, which is really cool. And when you repurpose this, you get to do some fun things like you know, building out this uh, a boxer in a dress kind of thing. You know, It's like, all right, well, we have all these are going to be those uh, sweep objects that we had, um, as we saw earlier. It's basically just a sweep. Um, actually, it might be the hair under, let's see. And this is where it gets a little hairy. So let's use our search feature here. Let's call hair. And so here's our hair strand. And if we come back out, we can hit S to reveal where, um, oops, let's come out and deselect that. Oh, I lost it already. <laughs> Let's come back here and type in hair. There's our hair strand. And if we turn this off, we can, it's still selected. You can hit S on the keyboard and it will reveal where it is in the stack. So that's a really handy uh, trick to know is that um, whenever you have something selected inside the viewport and you don't know where it is in the object manager, select it, hit S, and that will bring you to uh, that object in the object manager. So in this case, this hair strand is basically a cube. If I turn off that one cube, you can see uh, all the instances of that hair strand go away. Um, and then we also have like this, you know, another character that's just built up based off those uh, simple parts that we built up. Um, and this one has kind of Frankenstein, the arms with these skinny legs, big arms, skinny legs. Uh, and that brings us back to this. Um, one of the object tag or one of the tags inside of uh, Cinema 4D is called the vibrate tag. If you're familiar with uh, the wiggle expression inside of After Effects, this is a really similar thing. You can apply it to any object and it will wiggle just randomly. So I ended up applying it to a handful of controllers like this hand controller here. I can move and animate this independently, but because it has a vibrate tag, it will vibrate along with it. So if I play this back, you can see there's my hand, it's vibrating. If I select the vibrate tag, you can see it's moving just on the position. And I can amplify this up to something ridiculous like a frequency of 10, and it's gonna vibrate and shake that much more rapidly. And all the while, it can still move this and it will vibrate in place. So this is a really handy way to you know, get some relatively uh, pain-free animation going, uh, just to introduce some random, random movements with the vibrate tag. Okay, I'm checking out the time. I, I think we're coming up on f a little bit past 50 minutes. Um, I don't know if there's any questions available. Uh, I think I covered everything that I set out to touch base on, uh, but I wanted to pass it back to you, Ali, to see if there's any questions or um, if there any if there, I need to elaborate on anything else. Uh, hey, Alan, no questions just yet, but let's give them a moment. Maybe sure. some will trickle through. And uh, I guess while we're waiting, um, uh, maybe you could uh, explain um, what would you need to get started? What type of um, computer setup uh, would one need to be uh, fully prepared for this type of work? 
Right. Um, so After Effects, there's obviously minimum uh, system requirements in order to run After Effects in Cinema 4D, but uh, generally because we're working with, you know, few polygons in this, uh, for this, these examples, um, you know, a pretty modest laptop would work. Um, I'm, I personally am using a, a homebrew PC that I built myself. I'm running a, a 4090 uh, RTX video card, which helps a lot, uh, obviously, but you know, for this type of work, it doesn't really, um, for After Effects and for uh, for Cinema 4D, if you're doing some really heavy rendering that involves uh, photo real work, um, every, trying to make things look like reality, uh, those can be definitely very beneficial. Um, but, you know, to, to boot, you know, if you're really just working with simple characters like this and, and doing stylized character work, you know, you could get even get by with, um, you know, a, an integrated GPU that's on, uh, as part of your CPU, uh, you might drag a little bit, but you could definitely get by with it. Um, so I think that's kind of one of the cool things about Cinema 4D and and, and After Effects. It's, you know, uh, if, if you're going to push some of the higher end work, of course, you're going to need a beefier machine. But uh, to start, you know, it, it really runs on, on some pretty uh, modest uh, uh, PC specs or Mac specs. Um, I'm also using, uh, you know, I'm, I'm using a mouse for this presentation, but I also use uh, a pen display uh, to be able to draw on the screen um, when I'm doing work inside ZBrush. Uh, that really helps out to be able to draw uh, on the screen one to one instead of using a mouse and, and kind of have this disconnect between what you see on screen and what you're actually, you know, physically touching uh, with your pen or, or stylus. And then for my monitor, I'm using, um, you know, of course, BenQ. Uh, these great monitors for a 34 inch widescreen. Uh, I'm only showing a, a, por a portion of this in 16 by nine, but the widescreen I found, uh, because I, I work, um, I toggle back and forth between After Effects, Cinema 4D, Adobe Premiere, uh, ZBrush, um, and you know Photoshop and Illustrator, of course, and having that extra real estate for a widescreen in a, I think it's a 21 by nine or 21 by 10 ratio, uh, you know, I, I dedicate uh, probably 75, 70 percent of my screen to uh, the main application, and then the other 30 for like web browsing, emails, um, things of that nature. Productive productivity side. If I'm using references, I'll put those references up in Photoshop and just or uh, uh, another reference app so that I can have multiple kind of a checkerboard or a mosaic of, of reference images to use from. Um, but uh, I think that's pretty much it from a visual uh, visual standpoint for for content creation tools that I use. Awesome, Alan. And um, yeah, no questions came through, um, but definitely uh, I know we're discussing in a part two, maybe we'll deeper dive into this. So uh, on behalf of BenQ, I, I want to thank you uh, for presenting today. Uh, lots of very good uh, knowledge here. It's going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly. And uh, awesome. Alan, thank you so much. Thanks, Ali. Thanks, BenQ, for having me. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Hope to see you on the next one. Take care. Take care, everyone. Good night.